Let's get to the second game, Mario. Once again, we have a game where you're playing with the black pieces and once again, you're playing the Sicilian. And I'm a big fan of Sicilian, so not unhappy to see this. And here we have the time enough. In fact, one of the main lines here with long castle, very sharp line. And I'm sure you know more about it than I do. I believe white played a little bit of a sideline here. And here you go, bishop b7, which is a sideline and a sideline, if I may say so. Uh, seems to be fine. Uh, even better though, I think just equalizing should be knight takes d4 here. And you also posted a game um, between Fedosev and Quesada Perez, um, which was recently played. And yeah, you might look into this a little bit, but as I saw from the computer evaluation, this should be equal. But also bishop b7 should be fine. Uh, even though I saw, okay, white can go something like this, bishop f4, and then win the pawn on d6. But also this should not be too much trouble for black. Okay, I don't think, yeah, you don't need to probably spend that much time on this variation as it's pretty rare. But in general, you should be knowledgeable of the theory in this line because I think there are a lot of sharp lines and you need to you know your way around as usually in the time enough. I think there are a lot of dangerous lines in the time enough against the time enough. So um, good theory, theory, theory knowledge is very helpful. Okay, let's see what your opponent does. He plays very slowly and that's just uh, very risky in this kind of Sicilian. And here you could have already sized the initiative. Seize the initiative, I think. <laughs> That's how it's pronounced by, well, various ways, in fact. Uh, you're saying b4 when playing the Sicilian, you have to play energetically. Yes, I agree. Uh, you played h6 and this is indeed, uh, yeah, I mean, it's also, it looks very reasonable and it's fine, but you had better moves, right? So one way is to play b4, like you said here in knight e5, and this just looks attractive, playing knight c4, uh, sacrificing ideas always in the air here. And um, now you can go h6 and white is already tied up and you can follow with d5. Oh, this is gorgeous. I would love to play this position with black for sure. But you also had a more direct approach was to, to take on d4 and here to go either e5, this is what you pointed out, also looks interesting. But to play b4 right away is also very nice because if white plays knight e2, then you already have the sacrifice available because here this double attack is just crushing white on the spot, winning for black. So actually after b4, here white has to play g5 and then we get this position. Here black should give the piece right back, knight takes e4, but you also win a pawn here and um, it also looks good. Even though now that I'm looking at it, I mean just up Optically, I like the other one better, I think, where you just go b4 and then play knight e5 here. Just looks very nice, right? And I mean, b4 is always a move you want to consider. Okay, so h6, knight takes c6, queen takes, and now your pump made a mistake, you played e5, and you played correctly here, b4, and you end up just a pawn up, right, in this position. And this is what I would say a critical position. Because, okay, so far the last few moves were pretty straightforward, right? You want a pawn, but now the question is how to continue. And if you find the right way here, it will mean a lot for the rest of the game. So this is why it's a critical position, because if you play the correct move here, you will end up in a very good position with great winning chances. And it's important to identify these critical positions in your own games and to know, okay, I need to spend more time here. I need to spend more time because I'm feeling it will be important if I find the right continuation. And here, in fact, you have several good continuations, but the one you chose is making it more difficult for you. You play bishop d5. Um, okay, I'll tell you the one. Okay, there are two very attractive ones. The first one you also pointed out is rook takes c2, giving the exchange, but winning another um, pawn and forcing a queen trade as well, because king b1 
Well, King B1, I guess, would be possible. You're going to pick up another pawn, and then your three pawns, your king will be safe. It's just, um, just hopeless for, for white. So, queen d2 takes, king takes. But yeah, this position is also just, just so horrible for for white in every way. You have two pawns for the exchange. He has more weaknesses. You have the bishops. Mm. This will be very tough for white to play. Great winning chance, of course. But to me, I'm, I'm not a big fan of giving the exchange like that if I don't need to. I mean, it looks nice, yes. But to me, I would just play queen d5. This looks very, very simple. Because you're forcing a queen trade, pretty much, and you'll just enter an endgame a pawn up. Um, yeah, if you place king b1, you just go a5. Uh, white cannot avoid the queen trade, otherwise he'll lose the second pawn. And after takes takes, okay, bishop takes a6, there's rook a8, rook takes a2, doesn't help white. And otherwise, well, you're just a pawn up. So you have very great chances to convert here, you can go a5. I mean, this will be very tough for black because, uh, for white because he still has weakness over here, he doesn't really have counterplay. Um, yeah, this would have been a very safe way to play. And not sure if you saw Queen d5, you can let us know in the chat or if there was something you didn't like. But I would guess that you didn't consider it maybe because if you consider it and look at it a little bit, then I think you'll, you'll probably agree that this is just a safe option. And in this position, you, what you want to do is you want to trade queens because if you trade queens, Where's, where's the white compensation at all, right? And with bishop d5, you're allowing him to, to get something going. Um, bishop to g2, queen takes e5, bishop takes d5. And even if you... Well, I'm guessing that you had to see this coming, more or less. Bishop g2 was very logical, all of that. And that you maybe were happy with the position here but if i look at this position i wouldn't be very happy because you have now isolated pawns here you're right now two pawns up but of course you lose at least this one and somehow the position opened up but not in your favor your king is still on e8 so i would not like this at all um, we have to add that you had a great chance here to keep an advantage of bishop f6 very nice intermediate move and this reminds us we always need to keep our eyes open if there are any um, intermediate moves like this one that we didn't consider maybe okay so very nice move here bishop f6 threatening mate and after bishop d4 now queen takes d5 and you would get this end game where you're two points up right now now it's just one pawn, but you have good chances here in the rook end game. Of course, still complicated, but I would say good chances. Okay, so you're saying I didn't see queen d5, I was in the attack mood and I didn't see the intermediate bishop f6 move. Yeah, I mean in chess that's really what it's all about. Uh, it's not so much about calculating five moves in advance. It's more about seeing the right moves in the first or second or third move. That's what it's about. Seeing the moves. That's It's really just seeing the moves. But it's tough. It's tough for everybody. It's tough for me as well. It's tough for top level grandmasters. Sometimes they just don't see the move. If, they, if it only crossed their mind or your mind for a second that this move exists, you would look at it and you would very quickly come to a conclusion, oh, this is interesting. I'll you take a further look and there you go. Then you decide to play it. It's as simple as that, right? So what helps with that is I think studies or these um, made in two, made in three compositions, right? Compositions, not from actual games, but compositions where it's usually a hidden move. Um, it's a difficult move to find. And this really prompts your mind to look for all kinds of moves and to go into maybe weird directions as well, look for weird moves as well. 
uh, and because this is what you have to do to solve these studies to solve these two uh, made in two or made in three exercises and then what happens during the games you also look for all kinds of moves you don't only look for the logical moves um, but you look for all kinds of moves right and then you also think about moves like bishop f6 which of course is a move difficult to find but yeah like i said always have to keep the mind open pretty much that's the trick okay let's keep on going here you play queen takes f4 <clears throat> which is a mistake. You should just play queen f6. And why not, right? I mean, white cannot take, obviously. And if rook f2, castle, here's the line you're giving. Why not keep the queens on the board like that? Um, can bring the rook into the game. And white cannot really take on d7 because of rook d8. And you activate your rook. Okay, I mean, it doesn't look that clear, but um, it seems that, well, for one, you still have an extra pawn, and for the other, you can also put some pressure on this pawn on c2. So this looks uh, very nice for black, and you are pawn up after all. That's just something which slipped, slipped my mind for a moment, that you're pawn up still, and this gives you good chances. The problems with this endgame that you're going for is that it's a rook endgame and your rooks are still pretty passive. So in fact here, right now, white is even better. He messes up a little bit later, but he's even better. And um, yeah, that's of course an unfortunate transformation of the position, right? So I think you just misevaluated either this endgame thinking, okay, I'm right now two pawns up. Uh, should be good or um, Somehow you didn't like Queen f6 not sure Only you know really only you know, okay Let's see how this goes takes f6 rook ed2 rook c7 rook d6 rook a7 Yeah, just a small thing here rook a7 I like a5 much better. I mean, rook a7 also looks so passive. Um, and after that, white could have gotten an advantage with rook b6. But if you play a5, now if white goes after a pawn, rook a6, you can activate your rook, play rook e4. And this is nice. White should be able to hold the balance, uh, for example, b3, and then play h6. But it's always white who's fighting for the draw here. Even here, you're still pawn up. White should be able to, to make a draw with his two rooks, uh, getting enough play against the king. But it's white who has to make the draw here, for sure. Okay. So, yeah, I think this has a little bit to do with calculation, but also like feeling. I mean, rook a7, not a move you want to play, really, right? Uh, it looks odd, at least to me. Mm, okay, rook a7. Rook to d4, a5 now, okay. So this is all good, this is all good. You keep on fighting here, I like that. Even though here I thought, okay, you could also just play king e6 because then white cannot repeat moves, but it doesn't make that much of a difference. And now what happens is that you lose on time. And... Um, that's of course very unfortunate uh, to lose position on time because of course you're not worse and uh, yeah, this should not happen. Actually, right now I forgot, maybe maybe this was the rapid game and the other one was the, the long game. Um, yeah, I think the other one was the long game because I remember your comment, you said you still had seven minutes on the clock when you accepted the draw in the other one. So this is the rapid game. Okay, so I don't know which time control you played, but I'm guessing there was some kind of increment, delay, something that would give you more time. Uh, yeah, losing on time. Okay, it happens every once in a while. Only you know what exactly happened there, why you lost on time. But um, of course, that's uh, yeah, an unnecessary loss, obviously. And in this position, actually, you have a chance again to go for an advantage with rook c7. 
And you have to you had the right idea here, I would say, with rook e5 to trade rooks. But rook c7, this would be a better way to do it. If white now goes rook c5, you take and go rook e2 here. And after rook c4, you can get uh, this pawn going. And um, this g pawn will really cause um, white some trouble. If takes here for example you could also go rook e5 rook takes f5 and the g pawn he has to take he has to watch this pawn very closely and this gives you great chances so probably white should go king b3 here and now rook e3 check king e4 rook takes c2 of course it's tricky to do this because first it looks like black white can achieve a perpetual here but it turns out that you can go to f7 and then you can bring the rook in between and you have good winning chance i think once again so rook c7 was the way to do it but yeah unfortunately you lost some time i'm not sure why exactly that happened here only you know that of course 30 minute game with delay five seconds yeah delay five seconds it's really not much for everybody who doesn't know what delay is delay is a um, format that's used mostly in the us and uh, it means you play a move, then five seconds pass, and then only then your opponent's time runs. And same if your opponent makes a move, then five, time, five seconds pass, and only then your, your clock starts ticking. And that means you cannot gain time with increment. If you play a few moves quickly, you can gain some time, but with, with delay, if you're down to one second, all you have every time is these five seconds really. And um, if you cross it, you lose. So that's tough. Okay. All right, so what can we say about this game? Well, the opening went pretty well for you. And then I would say it was really about this moment when you play bishop d5. I think from then on, of course, you had two more chances, bishop f6 and then queen f6. Um, but I think this is the moment where it kind of, went a little bit bad uh, if you find the right choice there either rook takes c2 or queen d5 i think matter of taste then you have very great very good chances to win right and of course there were some other things here as well going into this end game also um just seemed like a misavaluation we have to take into consideration it was a rapid game uh quality of play of course is lower than a longer game still um seemed like that was not the right kind of exchange in this moment okay all right but great instructive games i think a lot to take from them also quite different games this time and um well mario let me know if you have any questions if there was anything uh, unclear like i said i would recommend to uh, solve more of these studies of these um, made in two made in three really to everybody this is a this is just very useful to get your mind looking for these candidate moves um, also what I do sometimes is I just ask myself am I missing something here what what am I missing here to, to ask yourself am I missing something it's too easy for your mind to just say, no, you're not missing anything, right? So ask yourself, what am I missing? What am I missing here? Am I missing it? What kind of move am I missing either for myself or for my pawn? And then your brain will try to find an answer. Okay, maybe you're not missing anything, but <laughs> in most cases, probably you do, right? And especially in a situation with many attractive moves, you want to make sure you see them all. You see them all, you at least think about them for a moment and that's like i said that can really make the difference because when you see when you just spot the moves then it's that's the first step it's just the first step if you don't see the move then 